In this video, we take a look at another Paper 2 walkthrough going through the one from Paper 2 Region 2 from May and June of 2022. So this was last year's Paper 2 review. Somebody asked if I'd walk through the solutions, so we're going to do that today. So let's go ahead and let's dive into it and get through this Paper 2, getting as much points as possible. All right, refer to the insert for the list of pseudocode functions and operators. These first few questions are almost give me points. A programmer is testing a program using a IDE. This is what we program in. Uh, if you're using Java, Python, or uh, VB.NET, you program in a integrated development, development environment. Now, the programmer wants the program to stop when it reaches a specific instruction or program statement in order to check the value assigned to a variable, give the technical term when the program stops. So we want it to actually stop at a specific point. We call that a break point. Uh, you can set those up in your program. The following table lists some activities from the program development lifecycle. And there are five stages of the program development lifecycle. We have four boxes here, so they don't want us to use all Five. So it says an identifier table is produced. This is going to happen during the design stage, which is after analysis. You're starting to figure out, okay, what does the program need? And you start, once you start figuring that out, one of the things you're going to figure out it needs is going to be variables. And you set up an identifier table in the design stage. Syntax errors can occur. This means your program will not even run. Well, there's only one time that's gonna happen, and that's in the coding stage when you are using a high-level language. The developer discusses the program requirements with the customer. Well, if you're asking the customer, hey, what do you want the program to do? You're in the first stage of the development cycle, which is the analysis stage. And the last one, a trace table is produced Okay, so this means you're not actually coding it out. Um, you've already coded it. Now you're trying to see, okay, is my code gonna work? I'm gonna use a trace table. And that is in the fourth stage, which is testing. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next page and get even more points. And when you take a look at the next page here, it says an identifier table includes the names of identifiers used. What this means is we have a, a table filled with variables and what the variable name is. State two other pieces of information that the identifier table should contain. Well, we need to know what is its purpose. We also need to know its data type. We wanna know if you look on any identifier table, it tells us what the variable is used for and its data type. Something else would be an example of data used by the identifier, whether it's a global variable, whether it's a local variable. The index is used by an array, including the upper and lower bounds. You just need to pick two uh, from this table, but I think that encompasses everything. Let's go ahead and let's keep moving on. So the pseudocode statements in the following table may, may contain errors. So this is worth four points. It says state the error in each case or write no error if the statement contains no error. You can assume that none of the variables referenced are of an incorrect type and that's important to know. So we take a look at this first one, status, true and false. When I look at the index or the appendix that comes with it, I can look here and says performs a logical and on two Boolean values. Is true a Boolean value? Yes, it is. Is false a Boolean value? Yes, it is. True and false evaluates to false. That is exactly what they've used here, and that is going to be stored inside st uh, status. That means there's no error there. When we take a look at the next one, if length password, now this is a string, so it's in quotes, we know that's okay, is less than 10 in a string, then is there an error here? Well, let's take a look at length. So it says length, this string as a string, which is this case password, returns an integer. Length happy days returns 10. Okay, so this is gonna do something if it's less than 10, but I can't take the length if it returns an integer. I can't compare an integer to a string. And how do I know 10's a string? Because it has double quotes around it. How do I fix that? I need to get rid of the quotes around the 10. It should compare an integer, not a string value. Then we have code. L case, electrical. So we take a look at our appendix and we look at L case. This char declared as character returns a character. So this is not a character, this is a string. 
that's not allowed. So L case works with character, not a string, should have used two lower instead. If you're wondering where I'm getting the two lower from, that was from the appendix as well. Then we have result is num, 20, negative 27.3, well, that parameter should be a string, not a real or decimal value. Because the is num in the appendix, um, we're looking to see if a string is a number. So the parameter should be a string, not a real or decimal value. So it should be, quote, negative 27.3, end quote. Let's move on to the next page. So in this one, an algorithm is described as follows. Input an integer value, okay? Jump to step six if the value is less than zero. Call the function is prime using the integer value as a parameter. That is a good one here. Keep account of the number of times function is prime returns true. Repeat from step one, step six, output the value of the count with a suitable message. For this one, you have to really know your shapes of your flowchart and be able to write a simple algorithm. So I strongly encourage you to pause here, sketch out this flowchart, and then we'll go over the answer. All right, let's go ahead and let's go over the answer. So here is the flowchart with the correct symbols. So we start by declaring some variables we're gonna need. Num, we're gonna initialize that to zero. Result, we're gonna initialize to false. Count, we're going to initialize to zero. And then it says it's to input a number. So we input a number. As long as it's uh, greater than zero, it's going to run. Now, if the number is less than zero, we're going to jump down to step six, which would be to output a message. So this would be the direction. If it's yes, we would go out to the right if the direction is no. So let's say the number is not less than zero. Then what we need to do is we need to call and find out is it prime? So the result is prime. What are we passing down? We're passing down num, which is the number the user entered. And then that's gonna be stored as a result. Now we said is prime returns a Boolean value. So it's gonna be true or false. So if it's not less than zero, we're gonna to check to see if it's a prime number. Now, the one thing I wanna point out and you have to look closely when you are calling another procedure or function, notice it has these boxes on the left and right hand side. It can be a little difficult to see, but if you look closely, you'll see those. If we just had a rectangle, that would be an assignment operator. Because we're calling a function or procedure, we're gonna put in those boxes. And that is one shape that the book does not cover. So um, this is a really good example to learn something new uh, to add on. So then we use another diamond, which is a if statement. It's a conditional yes or no. Is the result equal to true? If so, then what we're going to do is we're going to increment count by one because it's keeping count of how many prime numbers there are. Now, this is going to loop all the way back around so they can input a, another number. Now, don't forget, you also need to draw an arrow from no because if the result is false, we still need to loop back around, so make sure you draw your arrow there. Now that we're done with the hard part, we can finish this up with step six, which is output a suitable message. So we output total number of prime nums are, and then we simply output the count. So what you wanna remember here, rectangles, those are your assignment uh, statements. Your diamonds with the keyword input and output or those are, those are parallelograms, sorry. Your input and output are your parallelograms, a slanted rectangle. Your diamonds are your condition statements or selection statements. The rectangles with the uh, black lines on the left and the right hand side, that means we're calling a function or procedure. And uh, rectangle, again, we're assigning the value of count by incrementing it by one. Make sure when you do your diamonds, your selection, you output both yes and know to show where your flow chart is going. So just like that, you can pick up uh, four points. Let's take a look at the next page. On this page, it's all about, can you understand what a structured chart does and the symbols it represents? So we have uh, two functions here. We have three procedures. Remember, a function on a structured chart should have an arrow coming back to it. An open circle 
on the arrow means it is not a Boolean value. A filled in circle or closed circle with an arrow means it's returning a Boolean value. So we can see right here, mod V, that's returning a Boolean value. That one's gonna be real easy to find because it's gonna be the only one that's coming back with a closed circle. It says an additional module head repeatedly calls three of the modules in sequence. A structured chart has been partially completed. Complete the structured chart to include the information given about the six modules. Do not label the parameters. Do not write the module names. Um, that's fine. We can figure out what it's doing. So it says um, an additional module head repeatedly calls three of the modules in sequence. Well, if I look at my structure chart, there is only one module that calls B, C, D, or three modules uh, to begin with, and it calls them in sequence. Um, so B, C, and D are in sequence. So um, it says repeatedly calls. That means A is going to have a loop, and I'm going to show that on my diagram by drawing a curve that transverses the three lines just like this. Doing that is enough to get me a point. Now, let's take a look at some things we have here. Function mod v s2 integer. So we're passing down an integer, it returns a Boolean. So I know that goes right here at d. Because if I look at b, there's nothing being returned here. If I look at c, nothing is being returned. I know that because d, this is returning a Boolean value, I have to pass down that integer. Integer is not a Boolean value, so I have it with an open circle. All right, so that's how I know that's there. Now, uh, that takes care of D. There's nothing to do with B and C. Now we have E and F. So E and F, when I look at E, it says function mod Z, we're passing down a real, it returns an integer. Okay, that's gotta be E. F only accept, or F is passing down two parameters, not one. So I know E must be this one. If I look at mod Y, that has two parameters. If I look at mod X, that also has two parameters. If I look at procedure mod W, that has one parameter, but notice this is returning something. So it's gotta be one of the two functions. It can't be the returns Boolean because this isn't a Boolean, it's an integer. So I know I need to pass down a value that is not a Boolean open circle once again. So then um, we have to actually write out the name. So these are the functions uh, that we have here and we need to label them. So we're gonna take a look at A, B, C, uh, D. That's what we have here. Well, A, it told us was called head. It told us what it's called, B. When I look at B, B is, we're gonna look here, is passing down one it's not returning anything. Well, there's only one that's doing that, and that is mod W. Right here, it's passing down a non-Boolean value, not returning anything. The next one we need to look at is C. Hmm, C is passing down one uh, parameter that's not a Boolean, but then it has this double arrow. It's passing it down and the same value is being returned. Well, that means it's overriding what is stored in that variable. It's not doing it by val, it must be doing it by ref. That is not in the book either, as far as uh, I could see. However, by ref uh, makes the most sense, so we make that mod x. The next one is d. Well, d is the only one that returns a Boolean value. This right here is a dead giveaway, and we know that must be mod v. Now, when we jump down to these last two, d, e, and f, we're gonna put mod v back. Well, we know e is passing down a non-Boolean value, and it's returning an integer. That's gotta be mod z. It's the only one returning something, and that leaves us with mod y, which is two parameters that are not Boolean. That is a real and an integer, and that is mod y. Now, that's a lot of work to pick up a few points. However, remember, every little point counts. So let's go ahead, let's move on. The structure chart represents part of a complex problem. The process of decomposition is used to break down the complex problem into subproblems. Describe three benefits of this approach. Why is it important that we break things down into the smallest subproblems possible? Well, subproblems are easier to understand and we're, they're able to be solved easier. Rather than trying to figure out multiple things, we're trying to figure out just one 
thing. Different teams can be used to solve individual subproblems as part of the life cycle design. Subproblems are easier to test and program. Rather than testing hundreds of lines of code, we're testing one part to see that it actually works. That is the importance of decomposition. So when you're looking at this, they're asking you, do you know the purpose and advantages of the process of decomposition? Let's take a look at the next page. Now it's time for the uh, problem solving part of the test. So you're gonna be asked things like that, that we just saw. Uh, to kind of test uh, a little bit of your knowledge, but the bulk of the points are gonna come from uh, problem solving. So you definitely wanna get as many points as possible. Remember, if you can't fully problem solve these, um, you can still pick up a few points. Some other things you may want to also test uh, while we're on the topic of paper two is a uh, white box testing, which is showing the ins and outs of each uh, procedure, black box testing, which is the input, the outputs, integration testing, which uh, we're gonna go over. This is when written modules uh, come together that were separate, they come together for uh, testing, alpha testing, beta testing, acceptance taste, uh, testing, make sure you know the maintenance. There are three of those, corrective, perfective, and adaptive. Uh, don't forget about the test data, which is uh, normal, abnormal, extreme, and boundary uh, testing data. I'll try to vi do a video on uh, those um, before Friday. But anyway, let's get into the problem solving of this. So it says the procedure last lines will do the following. Take the name of a text file as a parameter. If we can open the procedure, pass that parameter, and close the procedure, we're going to get a point. I'll put the last three lines from that file in the same order as they appear in the file. Use local variables x, y, and z for uh, the line. Store three lines from the file. You may assume the file exists and contains at least three lines. The last lines from a file. We could probably do the first line, first three lines standing on our head, but this is Cambridge. We need to make it more complex. So you may be saying, okay, how in the world am I gonna find the last three lines of a file? So let's imagine a file has 10 lines. Well, it doesn't tell us how many lines it has, but is there a way for us to count the lines? And then is there a way for us to get to right before the last three lines? And the answer is yes, there is. So. Uh, no problem solving there, we just need some variables. So procedures, last line, uh, last lines, file name string. There's not returning anything because it is a procedure. Declare line X, Y, and Z. That's gonna be a string, it told us uh, to do that. And then I need to declare total lines. I need to know how many lines there are. And then I can use the count control loop. I decided to use N, it doesn't matter what letter you use. You could use N, I, X, remember, inside pseudocode. You have to declare the index that is going to be incrementing, and those are gonna be an integer. Doing that will get you a couple points right there. But let's go ahead and let's get into the bulk of this. So here is our variables, and total lines I'm gonna initialize to zero. I'm gonna open the file, file name, which was passed as a parameter. Why am I opening it? What is the purpose? I'm gonna open it for a read. Well, I'm not EOF, which means while well, I'm not at the end of the file, for what file? File name. What am I trying to do? I want to traverse this entire file and figure out how many lines there are. So I'm going to read file name, cur line, which means I'm going to store it inside a current line. I have to do that because when I read file, I have to put something here. Uh, cur line isn't going to do anything right now. It's just being used so my pseudocode will work. And all I'm going to do is I'm gonna increment total lines by one because I'm doing, doing, doing a mathematical formula here. I'm doing total lines equals total lines plus uh, one. Then what I wanna do is I wanna close this file because if I get to the end and then try to read it, it's going to crash. So I wanna close it so I can refresh it again. So I'm gonna close the file. I'm gonna go ahead and open the file back up for reading then what I'm gonna do this time as I'm gonna do for in is one to total lines minus three. If I have 10 lines, that means if this is gonna run line one to seven because total lines 10 minus three is seven. That means the last three lines are gonna be line number eight, line number nine, line number 10. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read file, file name, cur line so my code works, next in. Once I reach line eight, which is at the end of seven, 
I know I'm on the last three lines. So all I'm gonna do is read file, file name, store that in line X, store in line Y, store in line Z, just like they asked me to. Then I'm gonna output line X, line Y, line Z. I'm gonna close file name. And there's one more thing I need to do to get my point. Now, if you run out of paper and you're like, huh, I only got one line of code left to write, whatever, you don't whatever, you ask for another sheet. Your testing center will have extra sheets that are blank where you can write extra code. You wanna identify the problem you're on as well as what letter you're on. So I ask for uh, an extra sheet and I write in procedure and that way I get all my points. Let's take a look at the next problem. The algorithm in part A is to be amended. The calling program will pass a number of lines to be output as well as the name of the text file. Number of lines could be any value from one to 30. It can be assumed the file contains at least the number of lines that are passed. A line three changes that would uh, be needed. So um, all we're gonna do is think about what we need to do. Well, we need to add an additional parameter to the procedure header to include a numerical value representing the number of lines uh, to be output. Then what we need to do is we need to make sure that we count the number of lines in the file, because if it says, hey, we wanna output lines one to six, then we can do that, and then we're gonna use a count control loop that outputs the lines in the file that it asks for, rather than running all the way down to the last three lines of uh, the file. So those are the uh, changes that would be uh, needed. For this one, as long as you can think of a um, logical change that can be made to the program, they'll give you points for it. There's not just three answers to this, there's a multitude of answers. So you're problem solving, you're asking, okay, how could I change the program to make it work? So um, that's what you would need to do. And you would spend more time than we just spent on it. I've already solved all these. I spent the good majority of today uh, going through and solving these, but uh, let's keep pushing along. So for this one, procedure encode contains a loop structure. Identify the type of loop, state the condition that ends the loop, do not include pseudocode statements in your answer. Well, looking at this pseudocode, we can easily find the loop. Here we have a preconditional loop while. So what type of loop is that? That is a preconditional loop. Your while loops are your preconditional loops. It's checking the condition before the code is executed. Then what is the condition? Well, the condition is as long as this number isn't zero. Well, it says state the condition that ends the loop. Well, the condition would be when this num equals zero, that is when it's going to uh, end. Then they give us a wonderful trace table uh, to do. And um, we've put the code on here, or I have put the code on here. Complete the trace table below by dry running the procedure in code when the following values are input. So they give us a whole bunch of values here and they want us to fill this out and they just want to give us points because all we're gonna do is follow exactly what the code does. Count A is zero, I need to be aware of that. Count B is 10, I need to be aware of that. Flag is true, I need to be aware of that. All I'm gonna do is follow this code. So we're gonna input a number, we input 12. Is 12 not equal to zero? Yes, 12 isn't zero. So then we do this char. What character are we isolating? Well, we're gonna do left, num to string this num, which means we're gonna isolate the first character, this one, the first character of this num. What is this char? That's a one, single quotes, because it is a character. Now, when it's a one, it wants us to increment count A by one. Count A is zero, I'm gonna increment it by one. There we go. And I run the rest of uh, the code, nothing happens. So all I'm gonna do is start that loop again and get ready to input the next number. The next number is 24. I put that in. So uh, the flag is true, if flag equals true, case of this char. Uh, so we're gonna get a two for uh, this char. And then it says if count B is less than 10, Count B isn't less than 10, so I don't need to worry about uh, incrementing uh, count A at all. Nothing happens. Because nothing happens, the loop repeats, and we go on to the next number, 57. Of course, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna isolate uh, the left, or the first digit of that 57, that becomes a five. Then I check one, two, three, four, I don't see a five, otherwise output ignored. And I output ignored double quotes because it's not a variable that is text. So make sure you put double quotes around it. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna input the next line. So the next one is 43. I'm gonna input 43. 
I am going to isolate the left character again. That becomes four. I check four. Count B. Okay, count B decrements by one. So 10 minus one is nine. And then I look again, flag becomes false. So I'm also gonna change flag from true to false. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run the next input, which is 56. That means I'm gonna have a five. Now flag is false. This says if flag equals true. So I check the else. If count A is greater than two, it isn't. So we run this else statement. We set count A to four. Then I run the next input, which is 22. I isolate uh, the two. Now flag is a uh, false here still. So um, we look, flag is not true. So if count A is greater than two, and it is this time, then flag equals not flag. So it means not false, and we output flip. Well, not false is true, and we output flip in double quotes, and I output the next number, 31. Isolate the first character. That is three. Flag is true. What happens in three? Count B decrements by one. So that means count B becomes eight. Then we output the next one, 32. I'm just going through these lists of numbers following the code. 32, gonna isolate that three. Flag is still true. Count B decrements again. It becomes seven. I output the next one, 47. Isolate four. Flag is true. So now it wants us to decrement count B and to set flag to false. So I'm going to decrement count B to six. Then I'm going to set the flag to false. I'm going to input the next number, 99. I'm going to isolate the first character, nine. Now flag is false. We look to see if count A is greater than two. Count A, last time I checked, was four. So we're going to flip that flag because it's now not flag, which is not false, which means it's true. We're going to output flip. So we change the flag to true. We output flip. We're on the last number, which is zero. And this says, while well, this num is not equal to zero. Well, it is zero, which means this code doesn't run. I checked the last part of my code now that we've exited the loop. And it says right here, here's our in while we output count A. Count A is four. So when I input zero, what is going to output? The number four. Because it's not a string, I'm just going to output four without quotes. And just like that, we pick up six points. So easily, easily able to be handled there. Just make sure you go nice and slow and just go line by line. When you go line by line, they're giving you uh, points that you can easily, easily uh, take. All right. Procedure in code is part of a modular program. Integration testing is to be carried out on the program. Describe integration testing. Well, modules that have been tested separately, they are brought together into a single program and it's gonna be tested as uh, a whole. That is uh, what it's going to be um, done. It's modules that have been tested separately, that's your one point. Bringing them together to be tested as a whole, that is your second point there. Let's continue and take a look at the next question. So a string represents a series of whole numbers separated by commas. So we have a string 12, comma 13, comma 451, comma 22. Assume that the comma character is used as a separator. Well, that makes sense. The string contains only the character 0 to 9 and the comma character. That makes it very, very easy uh, for us. A procedure parse will do the following. Take the string as a parameter, extract each number in turn, calculate the total value and average value of all the numbers, I'll put the total and average values with a suitable message. If you watched our, or watched the lottery um, program I made using array list, we did something very similar to this. The exception was instead of using commas, we use spaces. And this is why you want to code, code, code anytime you get the chance because it increases your problem solving abilities and you may encounter something that you've already done before. So let's go ahead and let's get this one done. So we want, uh, we don't get any points for writing procedure. They've already done this for, uh, for us. So we're gonna declare num count. We need to know how many numbers there are. Uh, that is for calculating uh, the average. We need to know the total. Well, that's part of calculating the average and we need n uh, to keep control of the index, that is the integer. I also need to declare average as a real number. That means it could be a decimal. And then the current character as a char, because it's going to be a one, two, one, three, four, five, one, or comma, or two, 
to, and then the string num, I need to be able to convert that to a number. So what I'm gonna do is actually build the string, a numerical string, and then I'll convert it to a number because I can't convert one to a number because then it's gonna be one and two. That's not the number, the number is 12. So I wanna keep building onto it until I hit a comma. And then once I hit the comma, I'll take the string I, I built and I'll turn it into a number. Let's take a look at how that uh, works. So I'm gonna set num count equal to zero because I don't have any numbers uh, that I've counted yet. My total is gonna be zero and I'm gonna set my string num uh, equal to uh, empty because nothing's in there. Now for in, I'm gonna set it one to length in string, that is the name of the parameter. So we have an in string, I'm gonna take that and this is gonna run the length of it because I need to get all the way to the end. This is one whole string, I wanna get all the way to the last digit. So my current character, I'm gonna use mid, in string, in comma one, It's uh, that is the formula you always use to isolate one character, that is gonna be my current character. Now if my current character isn't equal to a comma, then I know I need to build on to string num. So my string num is gonna be whatever's there and the current character. So the first time this runs, it's gonna be a one, then it's gonna be a two, then it's gonna be a comma. Well, what do I do when I have one, two, and then I hit a comma? Well, I run this else statement. So my else statement would be uh, this, num count equals num count plus one because now I have a number. I have the number one, two, which is 12. That's one number, which I need to keep track of to calculate the average. Total, I need to calculate the total, which is used for the average. So I'm gonna do total plus, and then what I'm gonna do, looking at my appendix, I'm gonna convert a string to a number. What am I doing? Uh, what am I converting to a number? STR num. So I'm converting that one, two to the number uh, 12. Uh, then I'm going to clean uh, string num again, because if I tack on another number and one, two is already there, I'm going to wind up with a completely uh, different number, a three digit number, a four digit, five digit, and uh, so on. That's going to close my end if, and then close my loop. Now, once I have that, I have total, I have the numbers, uh, how many numbers there were. So I'm gonna do uh, num count equals num count plus one. This is for the last number because I'm not gonna get a comma when I get to the last number. So I know I'm on the last number when I hit the uh, last uh, comma there. So num count equals num count plus one. And then what I've done is I've built onto that string because the character, the last two digits or three digits, whatever it may be, was not a comma. So I'm able to build that on right here. Then all I need to do is make sure outside my loop, because I'm not gonna hit another comma, that this code runs. So I have another number, total equals total plus string to num, and then I can calculate my average, I can output the average, and then we end the procedure. So we output total of all numbers were total, and an average of, and then AVG, which was uh, the average. Nothing too bad there, but they definitely uh, wanna see, okay, if you have a string, can you convert it to a number? If you're unsure what to do, just take a look at your appendix because they do expect you to use it. And uh, there will be things in there that you will need. There will also be things in there you do not need. So you're saying, okay, how do I convert a string to a number? Flip through your appendix and you'll be able to find it. A programming language has string functions equivalent to those given in the insert. And if you look at the insert, the appendix, you have left, right. You also have mid, but it says the language includes left, right, but it does not have a mid function. Write pseudocode for an algorithm to implement your own version of the mid function, which will operate in the same way as shown in the insert. So in the insert, or using mid, you use mid, then you pass three parameters, the string you're working with, where you want to start, from the starting point, how many characters uh, you want. Assume that the values passed to the function will be correct. So function mid, it's gonna be called mid because that's the name of uh, the function. So p string, which is my parameter string, start, which is gonna be an integer, that's where I wanna start from. Final is how many characters from the starting position do I want, and that's gonna return a uh, string. I need to know the string length, and then I need also to build uh, the return string based on what it needs. Now, we're gonna use herb computer science for this example. Uh, if you get stuck on code, start writing some things down. So when I came across this one, I said, 
okay, trying to keep track of what's going on in my head can be a little, uh, a little difficult to do. So I said, okay, I need to come up with a string. I said, ah, herb computer science is a good one. So once you have something written down, it makes it a lot easier because you have something to reference. Now you need to know how left, right, and mid uh, work to fully understand what this question is asking you to do. So when we use mid herb computer science, three, one, this would result in getting a B. That is what should output. I want to start at the third letter. I want one character. That's B. So all I need to do now that I have this written out, you don't have to show the examiners. I'm showing you what I wrote out so you can see what I'm talking about. When you have this written out, you're saying, okay, how am I going to get there? And there's a couple different ways to do it. The first thing I want to do is I want to get the length of the string P string, which was the parameter string. I need to get the length of that. Then what I need to do is my return string. I'm going to start from the right. I'm going to do P string. Then I'm going to get str length. So I got the string I'm working with, herb computer science. I want my starting point, which is the length minus start plus one. Now, when you follow the order of operations, minus the subtraction will happen, followed by the plus. So let's count herb computer science. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So I'm going to do 18, which is the length of the string, minus my start, which is three. That's 15 plus one is 16. I'm going to start from the right. So I'm going to start at the right. I'm going to go 16 characters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay. So that means that's going to give us, um, it's going to give us a uh, herb and we have ERB. So then I'm going to use left. What am I using left from? I'm using my return string, which I just built. And I want the final value, which is one. So I'm going to start with my return string. I'm going to start from the left. This is going to give us a B computer science. I said herb, that's not right. That's if we were going from the left. It's going to give us B computer science because when you're using right, it starts from the right and then it outputs everything. Uh, that's my fault. So this is going to be B computer science. So I want to start from the left and I want one character, which is the B. So that's going to give us the B. I return uh, the return string in my function. And when you write something out, it's a lot easier uh, to do. All right. The values passed to your mid function need to be validated. Assume the values are a correct data type. State two checks that could be applied to the values passed to the function. So uh, it's asking us, okay, if we were to write code, how can we make sure the values being passed? How can we make sure they are correct? Well, the length of the string needs to be greater than one to make sure it's actually isolating what we want. So we need to make sure it's actually working. If it's just one, well, they're not isolating the character. It's just going to be one character. The final parameter, or uh, that's that was mine, was called final. It must be greater than zero. Uh, you're not going to grab zero characters. You want to grab at least at least one uh, character. I strongly encourage you to code out the uh, pseudocode we just did so you can understand how it works, improve that problem solving. Let's keep pushing along and take a look at the next question. And before you know, we have made it to the last question. Program allows a user to save passwords used to log in the website. Stored password is then inserted automatically when the user logs into the corresponding website. A global 2D array secret of type string stores the passwords together with the website domain name where they are used. Secret contains 1,000 elements organized as 500 rows and two columns. Uh, 2D arrays are almost guaranteed to be on your uh, paper two test. They love to ask questions about 2D's arrays. Unused elements contain the empty string. These can occur anywhere in the array. So it uh, looks like in the first column, we're going to have the website. Why are we in the second column? we're going to have the uh, password. So uh, it gives us that information. It says for security, the passwords are stored in an encrypted form. Of course they are in the example. Um, the passwords cannot be used without being dec uh, decrypted. You may assume the encrypted form of a password will not be an empty string. Oh, good. They give us um, a decrypt uh, method, encrypt and exist. Okay, perfect. So, um, now that they've given us that, let's see what they actually want us to do. Write pseudocode for the module exist. Okay. It takes two parameters, a string, a character, performs a case-sensitive search for the character in the string. 
Returns true if the character occurs in the string, otherwise returns false. So we're taking a string and we're seeing if a character is inside the string. Uh, yeah, we can do that, uh, no problem. So function exists, p string, that's gonna be my parameter string, search the character we're searching for, it returns a Boolean. So I'm gonna declare lowercase i's integer this time, for i is uh, one to length, the length of my p string. I'm gonna see if the search equals, uh, I'm gonna use my mid function, isolate each character one at a time using the same formula we always use, a string, comma, i, comma, one. And then uh, if it does equal, I'm gonna return true. I'm gonna end if, I'm gonna close my loop. If I run through the entire loop and the character is not there, then I'm going to return false. Notice that this is outside the loop. Once you hit that return statement, it, uh, it exits the uh, function. So uh, that one uh, we're able to get, not really sure what purpose that serves. Maybe we'll find out uh, later, cause uh, yeah. All right, moving on, B, a new module search dupl duplicates will Search for the first password that occurs more than once in the array. I'll put a message each time a duplicate is found. For example, the same password was used for three websites, this website.com, website27.net, and website z99.org. The following messages would be out, uh, output. Password for this website also used, okay. So um, we need to adjust our algorithm when we write it here so it doesn't show the same thing uh, more than once. And then it says, if no duplicates are found, no duplicate passwords uh, are found. Write efficient pseudocode for the module search duplicates. Encrypt and decrypt functions have been written. So we'll need to uh, call decrypt here. Um, so remember, it's a 2D array. Uh, the first column is gonna be the website. The second column is gonna be uh, the password. We need to keep track of uh, two separate uh, indexes here. One for, um, one for the row, and uh, there's multiple rows we'll need to check, so let's let's jump into this. So we have procedure search duplicates. We're gonna declare in and x as integer. Those are gonna be my two values. You'll see why in a moment. Uh, duplicates is gonna be a Boolean because there either are or there aren't duplicates. And then the password. I need to figure out what is the first password and then compare it to the password of every future website. So while uh, duplicates equals false and n is less than 500, and remember there's only 500 websites. So as long as we're less than 500, uh, we're good. I need to figure out what is the password we're using. Well, we're gonna do password secret uh, zero two. Remember 2D array is called secret. So I'm gonna grab that first password and I wanna start from the beginning of uh, my index. Now, if the password is blank, then um, or I'm sorry, if it's not equal, no, those are not equal to blank, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna decrypt the password. I'm gonna call my decrypt function. What am I passing down? I'm passing password, which is just a bunch of dark circles, uh, as we saw in the description. I'm gonna store that in password. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do for x equals n plus one to 500. I'm gonna check the next one there. So this is where we left off. For x is n plus one to 500. If secret x two, meaning if it's not equal to a blank, then I need to check and find out if that password is equal to the existing password. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna check all of them. So uh, decrypt secret x2, I'm gonna decrypt that password and see if it's equal to password. If it is equal, I'm gonna output, hey, password four, and then secret m1, the first website, is also used for, then I'm gonna call my secret array x comma one. I'm gonna show those websites are actually equal together. And that's why I do n plus one, because I've already checked the first website. I need to check the next website. I don't want it to output the first uh, website again. I don't want it to say password for you know www.z99.org is the same as www.z99.org. That's why we have the n plus one. We set our duplicates uh, flag to true. We end if for these uh, first or this inner if statement. End if again for this if statement. We close out a for loop. We end if this password, making sure it wasn't equal to blank. So uh, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna check the very next row to see if that password has been used anywhere else in the program. And in while, we'll loop us back to the top. Now, duplicates equals false. 
then we output no duplicates found and we end the procedure. So uh, that takes care of the two uh, messages. Let's take a look at the last question here. A password has a fixed format consisting of three groups of four alphanumeric characters separated by the hyphen character. An example of a password, and they give some random uh, numbers and strings. Each password must be 14 characters long, be organized as three groups of four alphanumeric characters. The groups are separated by hyphen characters. Do not include any duplicated characters except for the hyphen characters. An algorithm is needed for a new function, generate password, which will generate and return a password in this format. Assume the following modules have already been written, exists, random them uh, character. So that's why they had us write exist. Um, so describe the algorithm for generate uh, password. So how will generate password work? And there's a lot that we can uh, write here and you wanna be pretty specific, but this is where structured English uh, comes into play. So the password to be returned is initialized at the beginning. I'm gonna make it set equal to uh, quote, quote, nothing inside of there. Uh, using a post conditional loop, a uh, random charge used to generate a random character and then is passed to exist to see if the character already exists in the password. If not, then the character is added to the password. Using a count variable, when the length of the password is four or eight, a hyphen is built onto the existing string to separate the groups of four characters. When the length of the password is 14, the loop exits, setting a Boolean variable called success to true because we have no idea how many times this loop is going to run. So I want to use a post conditional loop. I want to check it at the end. Um, a post conditional loop is best to use here because our loop is going to run at least one time. If you don't know if the loop's going to run, you use preconditional. If your loop's going to run at least one time, you use a post conditional loop. Do not just say using a loop. You want to be specific post conditional loop here. The exit condition for the post conditional loop is until success equals true the function returns the password. And that is gonna wrap it up for our paper two review. It was a long one. I hope you guys found this helpful. If you did, please take a moment, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to help the channel grow. And we'll see you guys in the next video.